get started. So today we are honored to be joined by representatives of the Governor's Energy Office, the body responsible for planning and coordinating state energy policy. Director Dan Burgess was appointed to this position by Governor Mills in March of 2019. He has degrees from the University of Maine in Northeastern. And prior to his appointment here in Maine, he spent eight years for some reason in Massachusetts at their Department of Energy Resources. Just a little Massachusetts jab in there, I can't resist. Welcome, Dan. Deputy Director Selena Cunningham spent more than a decade in federal public service at the Department of the Interior and the US House of Representatives before joining the Solar Industries Association as a Vice President and Chief of Staff. She joined the Governor's Energy Office in March of 2020. Welcome, Deputy Director Cunningham. Thank you. And without further ado, I will turn it over to you both to get started. Thank you so much for joining us. Great, thank you so much for having us, Nick. And uh, thank you to the entire Audubon team for um, for hosting that what uh, sounds like was a really uh, thorough and um, exciting kind of series of, of, of webinars and presentations. Um, I'm also, as I'm, I didn't type it in the box about where I'm, where I'm calling from, but uh, currently reside in Falmouth and am very grateful to the Audubon for their, uh, uh, for their operations in Falmouth. Our family was out there yesterday having a picnic lunch. Um, so thank you for, thanks for all that you do. Um, so I'm, again, Dan Burgess, Director of the Governor's Energy Office, and I'm really uh, pleased to be here today to talk to you about uh, floating offshore wind in the Gulf of Maine. Um, I'm uh, going to begin the presentation and turn it to turn it to Selena. I'll have to leave a little bit a little bit early today, but I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to to speak to you all. So, next slide. Why uh, why offshore wind uh, in Maine? I think Nick gave a really nice overview of of some of the uh, opportunities and some of the uh, reasons uh, why Maine has been pursuing offshore wind for more than a decade and why, you know, why we're seeing um, the opportunities um, uh, that we're working on now. I think as you can see from this map from NREL, uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab, when looking at wind speeds uh, off the coast of the United States, you can see that Maine has some of uh, the best uh, and most sustained wind speeds in the country, in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, we have uh, what has been described as world, world-class offshore winds right off of our coast. And we're gonna talk a little bit, little bit about some of the um, uh, uh, developments happening along, along the East Coast. Offshore wind was um, highlighted by uh, a few most recent reports um, in Maine from the, the Maine Climate Council report to the uh, economic development or the economic um, 10-year plan to the Economic Recovery Committee. Offshore wind has continued to play, uh, you know, what has been seen by policymakers and those engaged in this as a really, really big opportunity for the state. Uh, we were fortunate to have uh, uh, UMaine uh, and the, the work that they've done, um, and we are uh, really do see a big economic opportunity for for development. And we'll get into to each of those. Next slide. So. When you think about offshore wind for uh, um, you know climate change, as, as Nick talked about, and as you are all well aware, climate change is affecting um, Maine in, in uh, numerous ways, in myriad ways. Uh, 2020 was the warmest year on record uh, in Portland. Gulf of Maine is warming 99% uh, faster than uh, uh, other ocean bodies on Earth. And Maine actually uh, is the most heating oil dependent state in the country. And so more than 60% of Maine's uh, households utilize oil as their primary heating source. And so there really is a, a, a big opportunity to um, move forward with what is known as beneficial or strategic electrification uh, with 85% of our emissions coming from either the transportation sector or the building sector. There is a really, uh, we are working on strategies to electrify both through uh, air source heat pumps and heat pump up water heaters, but also through um, uh, uh, things like electric vehicles as, as primary opportunities to reduce um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuels. Um, we need to make sure that we've got the renewable energy uh, in place to back up that electrification. So as the Climate Council plan laid out, we are um, advancing heat pump opportunities. We are advancing um, opportunities for transportation electrification uh, so we need to make sure that we've got the the um, 
renewable energy on the grid to, to back that up and help us reduce emissions. Next slide. So when you think about how offshore wind can help, help us do that again, Gulf of Maine has some of the best resources in the world, but it's also, um, as you saw from that map, it's very close to load zones, right? If you think about where the most population is uh, uh, residing up and down the East Coast or you know, the urban centers where the most electricity is being used is pretty close to offshore wind. So it plays a good, um, there's a, a good opportunity there. Uh, we do have um, uh, really uh, good wind speeds in the winter when some of our energy need is the greatest, particularly as we electrify, we all we all go home when it's when it's uh, cold and snowy, and we you know we turn on our lights, our computers, and more and more we'll be uh, uh, turning on our our heat pumps um, and others, and so that that is when offshore wind uh, speeds are, are are greatest. So there's an opportunity there. Maine actually has uh, one of the most ambitious renewable energy targets in the country. We have a, a requirement that 80% of our renewable energy will come from, 80% uh, of the state's energy will come from renewable energy by 2030. Right now we're at about 40%. So as we increase that from 40 or 42% where we are to 80% by 2030, we need to make sure that we have the renewable um, energy uh, projects and, and developments in place to help us meet, meet that. And offshore wind being such a strong uh, resource that is well positioned, uh, both from a, a timing perspective, but also from a, a load pro profile perspective, will be you know a, a really big opportunity for us to help do that. Um, and I think that again, it's not just Maine, but uh, up and down the East Coast as well. And then I think that what we've seen is the more investments that are made into offshore wind, the more technology advances, the uh, 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 greater opportunity for cost reduction. We've just seen really staggering um, uh, reductions in, in cost for fixed bottom um, uh, offshore wind, and uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab predicts a similar cost curve reduction for, for floating. As you think about kind of development as it as it happens, and more fixed bottom areas are are no longer no longer available, the thought is that longer term floating offshore wind is really going to play a, a significant opportunity. Next slide. So along with the energy opportunity, there's also an economic benefit opportunity. Uh, one study a couple of years ago was done, showed that uh, offshore wind could be a $70 billion industry in the US. Um, if you actually look at where uh, the, the fastest growing, not just sectors, but the fastest growing jobs across the country, uh, according to the US Census Bureau, two out of the top three are in re the renewable energy fields. So it's uh, wind technician, and solar installer are, are two out of the top three. The third, I believe, um, is uh, a nursing uh, position. But you can see, not just in Maine, but across the country, that uh, the renewable energy sector really is a high growth opportunity. Um, and the governor has actually set a, a goal of doubling the number of clean energy jobs in the state uh, to getting to 30,000 clean energy jobs by 2030. We've, um, we're actually historically have been lowest per capita in clean energy jobs in New England. And so we, we do see a big opportunity to uh, invest in um, and, and support renewable energy, not just growth, but the economic opportunities that come with it. Uh, we are, as we're going to talk about in a minute, we're seeing, um, you know, commitments from the, the Biden administration and other states that are advancing offshore wind. And uh, we just see Maine as unique, uniquely positioned with the University of Maine Technology, which you all uh, heard more about from Dr. Dogger. Um, that they've been they've been developing this this floating offshore wind platform um, for more than a decade that has been supported by the U.S. Department of Energy, um, and it's a really a great opportunity to leverage the pod, uh, pr private public partnership um, to bring that to market. Um, and again, yes, the 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 workforce potential for skilled trades it's it's not just. Uh, one one type of job. It's everything from engineering to fabrication to operations and maintenance that will come with with developing this energy. Next slide. So for uh, we really see uh, offshore wind as an opportunity to, uh, uh, and what we're going to talk about today is to not just um, uh, move forward with offshore wind without considering the. Um, uh, effects on Maine's important fishing industry and as well as the marine ecosystem, we see, you know, an opportunity for Maine to, to, to lead in some of that research and scientific work that can happen with the de development of offshore wind. Uh, we, uh, the governor is um, committed to advancing a 
proposed moratorium in the most heavily fished and traveled areas, which are within state waters. So within um, state waters are uh, uh, three miles off of the coast and in. And so this project that we're going to talk to you about a little bit more is really focused on uh, federal waters, some 20 to 40 miles off the coast. And so, we, you know, we see this uh, as an opportunity to focus on that where, uh, um, where uh, we'll have least impact, where we can really work on the opportunity for, for research and engagement um, and, and work through, um, you know, really robust stakeholder engagement among those that could be impacted or those that are interested. Next slide. So if you look at the, as I talked about some of the commitments up and down the East Coast, uh, the maps on the right are um, Northeast and, and Mid-Atlantic wind energy areas that have been identified. So there's a, a process with, uh, run by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, which is a department, which is an, an agency within the Department of Interior that works to identify uh, wind energy areas that are then put up for lease and then are, um, are, are auctioned off for companies to lease and therefore develop offshore wind. And what you can see is that um, at, as of the end of last year, there were more than or close to 30,000 megawatts of state targets, um, predominantly in Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, uh, and Virginia. So those are uh, government targets and efforts to develop offshore wind. And on the right, you can see that there's actually um, close to 10,000 megawatts in contract opportunities. So these are uh, long-term contracts that will lead to the development of offshore wind. So from the Cape Cod south all the way down to North Carolina, you're seeing areas that are, are poised and primed for development of offshore wind. It's worth noting that there are currently seven turbines in the water right now. There's five off the coast of Rhode Island near Block Island, and then two off the coast of Virginia. And so with, uh, we're really kind of on the precipice of, of, of a brand new industry being formed in the U.S. Um, through these wind energy areas and the deployment of offshore wind on the East Coast. Next slide. And even just recently, uh, we've seen really significant action, um, again, at the federal level, but also the, the state level of, of commitment to offshore wind. Late last month, the Biden administration announced a 30 gigawatt target by 2030. Uh, they announced that they'd be focusing on um, some new leasing air and siting areas, particularly in the Mid-Atlantic in, in New York and New Jersey. They announced uh, $3 billion for offshore wind project financing. That could be from uh, uh, offshore wind manufacturing to port development um, and other areas that, to support offshore wind. Uh, as well as a, a targeted uh, $230 million for, for, for port development through the Department of Transportation. I think what was, um, you know, really um, exciting uh, or uh, noteworthy about the um, administration's um, announcements that were made is that they uh, brought together four different um, cabinet secretaries to make that announcement. There was the Department of Commerce, the Department of Interior, the Department of Energy, and the Department of Transportation all committed to working together collaboratively on offshore wind. So really a whole of government approach, which I think is, is, um, is new, but I also think underscores the commitment from the, from the Biden administration to, to pursue offshore wind. Uh, that same week, Massachusetts uh, uh, Governor Baker signed legislation to procure uh, an additional 2,400 megawatts by 2027. Um, so that is legislation on the books that will lead to additional procurement and, and development for offshore wind. And then uh, the same week um, in New Hampshire, uh, legislation was passed to procure up to 600 megawatts by 2023. I should note that that legislation has not gone through the House in New Hampshire, but is, it is uh, a, a sign of um, a growing interest in, in offshore wind. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Selena. Great. Thanks, Dan. Hi, everyone. So, um, sorry, my slide. Taking all of those um, components that go into uh, why the state of Maine is pursuing offshore wind, um, we're taking a, a, a number of steps to um, pursue offshore wind and part of, uh, under the Maine Offshore Wind in Initiative that the governor announced a, a couple of years ago. And um, the, the key components of this strategy are to recognize that there is a growing demand uh, 
for offshore wind in Maine um, and to take some active steps to prioritize Maine's interests as um, interest in offshore wind increases. We obviously need to address climate change and reduce fossil fuel use in, in Maine and offshore wind is one of, of several um, clean energy sources that the state is pursuing um, in terms of in meeting our future energy needs. We also have a long history in the state in terms of research and development and commitment to advancing offshore wind and um, from the university as well as from others um, that we are, are building on and in utilizing as we advance um, in the next going forward. We are, as Dan mentioned, focusing on federal waters uh, where we believe it is um, most prudent to have um, offshore wind activity and um, recognizing that we have um, some needs to have some opportunities for shared learning, that we are emphasizing research and planning to minimize impacts on the fisheries and the marine ecosystem. Uh, we also see opportunities for employment and um, new additive um, economic opportunity in the state um, and that Dan spoke about. So those are the components of the initiative that we are focusing on. And how we're doing that is a number of steps that we are taking. Number one is from a planning standpoint. So looking at the long-term nature of um, offshore wind in Maine, one thing that is unique about Maine is that we will re uh, most likely require floating technology, which as Dan mentioned, the, the price is, is, is cost is dropping um, significantly and projected to drop um, uh, quite significantly over the next um, coming years. And so if we're along, meeting our long-term energy needs, uh, floating technology is a, is a key source in doing planning that will help build the economic components and make sure that we um, determine the best ways to minimize impacts will be important. Um, we're also gonna talk about the Gulf of Maine uh, floating offshore wind research array, array, which is a state um, led initiative. And then we are um, supporting a number of public private partnerships. Um, number one is working closely with the University of Maine, both on their technology and then their other work that they've done over um, the last decade. Um, New England Aquaventus, which is a joint par partnership of two um, global offshore wind companies that are utilizing the University of Maine technology. Uh, we also signed a, the governor signed a memorandum of, of understanding with the United Kingdom and to pursue uh, opportunities for um, information sharing and other um, lessons learned from, a, a, which is a great opportunity for the state to, to learn from a European country that has significant experience with offshore wind. And the other public partnership that we are really excited about is the state recently uh, joined the National Offshore Wind Research Development Consortium which brings together um, leading voices from states, um, uh, public, private um, entities to look at where from an R&D standpoint, be it um, either on the technology side or um, uh, other ways that we can, we can um, advance research um, for offshore wind with the goal of reducing costs and minimizing impacts. So we'll continue our work with that consortium. And we also, are, have a number of deep water um, ports here in Maine. We are, in, the state is embarking on a study of Sears port um, for a potential offshore wind hub. And then there are roles that the other ports can, can play in supporting the offshore wind industry. And then as Dan mentioned, uh, there is a, a federal process for future commercial leasing. We are a member of the um, Gulf of Maine offshore wind uh, regional task force with Massachusetts and New Hampshire as well. And then in addition to that formal structure, we look for other ways to partner uh, regionally um, with Massachusetts, New Hampshire, as well as Canada to share, share information, share what research is needed. And uh, I think going forward, we'll wanna do more coordination on um, advancing the offshore wind industry as we, as, uh, we can um, in a way that makes the most sense for our region. So in terms of the roadmap, uh, the, uh, we received, the governor's energy office received a little bit over $2 million in October. And we are working on steps to stand up this um, stakeholder uh, effort that will focus on um, uh, how best to uh, maximize the opportunities and minimize impacts for offshore wind over the long term. There are a number of areas that we're going to look at. A lot of these are, are focused on um, both in an onshore component in addition to, to offshore um, uh, considerations um, from an energy market strategy, um, transmission, 
ports and infrastructure, economic impact, both um, in terms of um, cost and benefits associated with a new industry, um, considering equity, as well as um, uh, what opportunities there are around manufacturing, supply chains, workforce development, and research and ocean environmental compatibility. And so we're working on setting up a structure for that, that will, those will be um, publicly held meetings. We'll uh, go out to the public with uh, recommendations and seek feedback. And so we definitely look out for opportunities for, to engage on that and we welcome your engagement there. So in November of last year, the governor announced her intent to pursue um, the country's first floating offshore wind research array in federal waters. And so uh, since then, we've going, been going through a number of steps to advance this, uh, this project. We've held um, a series of, of meetings and webinars uh, to share information and seek feedback on um, how we should pursue this project in terms of um, areas that are best suited for an area that is best suited to, to site the project or their least impactful, I should say, and then um, research priorities. And so we've been going through a pretty um, uh, robust stakeholder process. We have a number of tools on our website in terms of um, past webinars, questions, uh, lots of information, where we can be um, happy to, to send you uh, a link to that and uh, where, where people can find more if, if you have questions after this and beyond today. So we're, we're in the early stages overall of this project. Um, it is, uh, in, we'll, the next step is, is applying for a, a lease for, in federal waters, and then it'll take a number of years to plan this um, and, and have something in the water um, potentially by 2025 or so. So um, in terms of why we're doing this research array, and I should say um, just briefly what it is. So it's a, um, a, a, a state-led um, project that would be in partnership with New England Aquaventus, which is the um, two global um, offshore wind companies that are partnering with the University of Maine on their one turbine project off Monhegan. This is a separate project, the research array that we're working on in the state. And it would be a um, floating offshore wind project that is um, 12 turbines or less. And it's in an area offshore, I'll show a map in a little bit, but that's um, at least 20 miles off the coast of Maine. And so a little bit about, about why we're doing this. Um, we, we, knowing that we're going to need floating technology, recognizing the importance of the fishing industry in, in our mar marine environment, we want to make sure that we have a better understanding um, and of, of, of how to um, best bring this technology into, the, uh, into our main waters prior to large scale commercial projects in the Gulf of Maine. We want to build on the experience of the university and the, um, the, the innovation that they've done in utilizing the floating offshore wind um, technology and supporting the University of Maine in their public-private partnership. And our goal is to work with the fishing industry and work with environmental and other organizations to really help answer key questions for how to best um, seek compatibility with existing ocean users. Um, and then uh, research what it means to bring this the floating floating turbines into the, into the Gulf of Maine. Um, as as I think Dan mentioned, there are no floating projects in in um, the U.S. and there are some worldwide, but um, there's definitely a lot that we can learn prior to seeing large projects in in, in Maine waters. And then um, there is a, one thing about offshore wind that is um, a little bit different than some other um, industries that the the lead time for planning is incredibly long, both from a permitting construction engineering standpoint. So this is a long-term process. We are starting these conversations now. It will be you know, about five years before we see anything in the water. And we wanna use this experience to inform our future, our future um, planning for offshore wind as well. So about the array, um, it's, as I mentioned, um, it's, it'll be 12 turbines or, or fewer. It, the lease that we're seeking will be 16 square miles. The project will be 20 to 40 miles offshore. And then some other, um, uh, it'll interconnect into either Wiscasa or, or um, uh, off of Yarmouth. And um, we are seeking to, some of the key priorities in, in citing this project are minimizing conflicts with fishing grounds, avoiding high traffic areas and limiting visibility from shore. Also a key component is minimizing impacts to um, uh, uh, 
uh, important uh, protected species and other um, important ecosystem. Um, so this is just a visual of the uh, uh, potential for the project. Um, the lines between the um, turbines will be um, buried if at all possible and, and covered if not. And then you can see um, this is a little boat there to give you a side of the scale of um, what it could look like. And this is just two, it would be up to 12 for the project. And you probably wouldn't see any land like you do in this picture. And this is just another visualization. This is a map of the area. So Wyman Station in Yarmouth and then Main Yankee and West Cassett are the two areas, potential areas that won't be decided at this point, but that um, the project will interconnect into uh, via cable. The cable will be buried where possible um, and, and covered where, where not. Um, we would certainly want to work with communities and um, fishing industry and other stakeholders on determining the, the, the best um, route. And in terms of the size of the project, this circle here is the um, this 16 square miles. So this is an area that the state identified as an area of interest that is um, in close proximity to high voltage uh, near shore interconnection points that makes the project um, should be uh, easier to in interconnect into than other um, areas of their coast. Um, and so, uh, although there's uh, one or two other interconnection points um, elsewhere in the state. So, this is the area that we're, we're focusing on the project from within. We'll choose this, identify an area that is 16 square miles from within this area here. And um, this is just a, a visual of the technology. I'm glad you had Dr. Habib Dagger to speak to you more about it. Uh, it's a pretty unique design in that it uses, utilizes concrete and can be made locally, which is um, not, which is, which is um, different than some of the other platforms. Um, so definitely encourage you to listen to his presentation if you haven't, if you missed it. And so a key component of what we're doing in this project is re really using it as a, um, a, a opportunity to, to research um, and to, to answer some fundamental questions that we believe are important to answer for our state and for make the, the data available to anyone. Um, and so there are some themes that we identified. There's a lot of details that can go into that in terms of the specifics, but just to give you a sense of the area of, of research that we want to pursue. And then we um, are also really open to um, feedback on not only the research, but also um, using that to help our decisions around siting and project design. And so overall, uh, Maine is taking this is, is, is taking a phased approach, which we think is the prudent approach for Maine, um, given all the reasons that we walk through. We've taken two steps along this path. One is the Castine project, um, the project 1A scale project off Castine in 2013, the Monhegan project, which is um, on pace for 2023, which would be the first floating offshore wind project in US waters. Uh, that's in state waters. And then the 2025 target for the um, state-led research array in federal waters. And we um, do anticipate at some point there'll be commercial leasing in the Gulf of Maine. The timing for that is uh, to be determined. And so there's my contact email and then an offshore wind email address as well as I encourage you to check out our website. There's lots of information there. Um, I'll just do a stop sharing there. I'll just note that I didn't go into um, significant detail, but through our stakeholder process in terms of helping us identify where to cite this research array, we've held a number of um, work sessions and conversations with um, research uh, entities and the public to seek feedback on a number of areas, but the specific, one of the areas of focus is on wildlife and hearing from um, what we know about the area, how we can identify a spot that minimizes impacts to listed species, um, and we've, we, um, so that the process has been going, ongoing, but we've certainly learned a lot and appreciate the, the dialogue that we've had so far. So that's been a lot. I think we've lost Dan, but I'm happy to um, open it up for any questions. Great, Selena, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, this is really exciting what Maine is doing and thanks for your work to, to keep it going for, further. Um, I have a couple of just clarifying questions because I, um, I, I have, um, you've got some of the same questions from folks 
um, um, not necessarily today, but throughout. So I just want to clarify a few things. And folks, if you do have questions that we've got to in a minute, please put them in the Q&A box down below. I see some of you doing that already. Um, so the two things I want to clarify. First, um, can you just, the relationship between the single turbine going off of Monhegan and this array, just so people are very clear on that. Sure. So the, um, the project off Monhegan Island is a, a partnership with the University of Maine and New England Aquaventus, which is the two companies, Diamond Offshore and RWE Renewables. And um, that project is in state waters, has been in development for a number of years, and is targeted for um, uh, the uh, 2023. The while we will learn a tremendous amount of information from the Monhegan project, both in terms of the technology and the, and, and um, uh, further testing the university's technology as we think about how it can be used in other places around the world as the offshore wind industry is growing dramatically. So from the state's perspective, that's very encouraging. We'll also get important monitoring data and um, some experience about what it means to have that um, turbine in the water. The research array is a state-led initiative. So it'll be a state partnership with New England Aquaventus using the technology, um, but with multi-turbines. And, and while we learn a lot from one, you, you really are not able to learn as much with that multi-turbine um, array when it comes to answering critical questions about what large scale projects mean. So when we think about how we want to um, either transit between turbines or whether we can fish between the turbines, that you can't test with a, just a one project. So that's some of the reasons why we're pursuing this multi-turbine array is answering some of these fundamental questions, continuing to demonstrate the technology. Um, and so it's, uh, it, I can certainly understand that there's a lot going on there, a lot of, um, but, uh, happy to answer other questions. Too. Sure, I think it's important to remember because the, the the single turbine off of Monhegan is in the news. Um, that you know the what is going on there is just one single turbine, just as a test, um, and this is to test the technology that is being developed in the state of Maine, largely um, in order so that we can move it elsewhere. So this is not sort of the first of a bunch of turbines that are going going to go up Monhegan. This is really to test it there to see how it's working. And then we're going to move it uh, as part of a, a, the larger test, this research array, um, way out of sight, far farther away from lots of other folks. Yeah, I just argue that I just want to clarify that that the Monhegan project is a separate. The turbine will is you know has its own timeline, its own uh, interconnection cable, and um, kind of agreement to be there in place, and that the research array will be a separate project, utilizing the same type of technology, but not necessarily that it's just a, it's a separate project there. So. Got you, great. And my second clarifying point, and you made it well, I just wanted to reinforce it, is that the map you showed of the uh, potential area for the array, um, that big sort of oval, um, I'm correct that the eventual array is just going to be the size of that small blue dot that you had on the on the side. So it's not going to take up that whole space right now. It's just the small area that you're, that you're working on figuring out where within that larger oval that's going to be placed, correct? That's correct. Um, we we identified a, an area, um, although there are known conflicts um, within it, like um, that, that that's about 700, 750 um, or 70 um, square miles from that, we will identify a spot that's 16 square miles or less. Um, and we identified that area because of its proximity to interconnection points. Um, we, we set the 20 miles to um, uh, limit in terms of um, uh, known fishing, there's fishing activity obviously everywhere, including in that area, but the um, stay away from the, the most heavily fished areas, particularly as you go closer to shore. Um, and then also the maximum of 40 miles because um, of the project of this scale, um, we, we don't want to have a substation for this project. That's been the question that has, some people have had. We, our intention is to directly connect the 12 turbines uh, via a transmission cable that would be buried to shore um, without any, any uh, a substation. So keeping it in um, 40 miles or less, in, it's not an exact number, but around there will, will help um, eliminate the need for a substation. That's great. And just to reinforce, it's not something we've really talked about too much during this series, but one of the uh, potential benefits of offshore wind is that um, it is much closer to the areas that need power, right? And so, um, 
instead of um, putting transmission lines or transmission corridors or, or doing things on land that have to connect large areas uh, um, you know, from the power source a long way to where it's being used. Offshore wind is closer in theory to those cities, for example, um, and the cables can be buried or run along the ground where there is uh, sort of less disturbance. So something to keep in mind. Um, I do wanna ask a question that's been on the minds of a lot of our members about, um, say this array is up, there's you know a dozen or more turbines in the water. What happens if you are finding impacts? So um, what is your plan for sort of monitoring the environmental impacts especially? And what happens if you find something, you know, the, the, the impacts are larger than you expected? Yeah, this is a, a really important question. So in order to uh, even build this project, we're going to need to receive numerous federal, um, numerous permits, um, including related to the Endangered Species Act, Migratory Bird, um, other, other federal laws that are important to protecting uh, species. Um, as part of this, we want to use the, the, ex the experience of the research array to gain information with the hope of, if possible, making adjustments from, uh, you know, if there's a ways that we can, there's a lighting or certain techniques that we can use on the array itself that minimize impacts, we certainly want to pursue those. And then if we learn um, information that will help make future projects uh, less impactful, we want to bring those into future, um, future projects. Um, and so I think that, that in terms of whether the impacts, we, we will abide by the laws that, that we need to meet in terms of protecting the species and take every step that we can to minimize those impacts. Um, and so we'll uh, pursue this. And if, it, if, it, if the technology, um, you know, the, we, we believe that it will work. And if it doesn't, then that's something we'll have to address when we, when we, when we determine that. Mm -hmm. And is there a plan for along the way for information about potential impacts to be made public or for um, folks like Maine Audubon's members to be involved in, in, in the understanding? Yeah, so there are a couple of ways that the public can be can engage through um, the specific research array project over the long haul. Number one is that both um, at numerous stages, there'll be opportunity for public comment through the permitting process. In addition to that, the state um, intends to, to have additional stakeholder engagement beyond the existing permitting basic requirements. The third piece is that um, we anticipate uh, creating a research consortium to, there are obviously a lot of interest when it comes to what type of research we can do. And uh, we'll have to prioritize and come up with a strategy that both makes sense for all of our interests um, and then what, um, what is, what information is most um, important and how are we going to fund it? And so the state intends to, to uh, create a research consortium where we bring in both, um, you know, whether it be stakeholders, uh, whether it be the fishing industry, whether it be NGOs and others, in addition to um, uh, uh, offshore wind industry and other folks to help drive what are the, what is the strategy and then help drive some of the um, research that we do pursue. So that the, the research itself will absolutely be public the process we want to make as public as we haven't figured out all the details, but definitely want to make it inclusive and uh, opportunity for people to learn from this and have um, the data open. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, clarifying question from David, and I wonder if you could share your screen again and go back to the, the blue dot slide. I just want to make sure um, he, he wanted to double check and, and see that. Um, so again, on this, it's going to show the Gulf. There'll be a large sort of uh, jagged oval um, that is the area they are considering uh, to, there you go. So, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. So see this, there's this um, sort of, I don't know what shape you want to call that, uh, a, a jagged oval there. Um, the blue dot on the right is, that's going to be the eventual size of the proposed array. So if you think about where within that, the oval, that blue dot could be, that's the space we're looking at. Um, not at this point, the entire space, right? That's correct. Yes, okay. and it will not, it likely will not be a circle. So the other thing that we're um, seeking input on is the configuration um, of the site itself. Um, specifics around micro siting of the turbines will happen at a later date, ap date after we do, we identify the, the lease area and we do more site um, surveying to determine where the turbines will be. But, um, but yes, that's, that's correct. 
Great. And actually, in, in, to, to further help illustrate, if you could go to the slide that showed the sort of the potential imagery of what it might look like in the water, it was sort of the lineup. Um, there you go. Um, do, so this is potentially what the array could look like. Is that right? And, and could you tell us sort of what maybe the distances are we're looking at? Uh, sure. So this, it, there has not been a decision about the specific layout, and that's an area that we are um, seeking input on. The um, these are about um, a mile apart, um, although there is um, so that's the. Uh, the floating, the cable does go down in terms of um, the, the mooring line does go down a little bit beyond that you can't quite see. So there will be some sort of area around there, there that um, would have um, underwater um, cabling. And so this is about a mile between that. And in this example, it's two miles between these. And so this has been one, one, one proposal of having clusters of um, uh, four or so that you could do different things in different areas to help test um, different approaches, um, but one of one of several um, configurations that has been considered. Excellent. Um, enlightening. So uh, another question from a, a different David, David Little here in the comments. Um, and this will be, well, um, he asked about whether we know the Gulf of Maine is warming quickly. Um, do we know what effect that warming will have on the wind speeds in the Gulf? I mean, we've seen from the from the lead slide that um, you know uh, the Gulf of Maine has these excellent wind resources. Do we know what might happen there um, as it continues to warm? I don't know what scientists predict will happen in terms of. I know that there are um, some anticipated or already changing. Um, I, I'm not gonna. Not sure. Good question, David. Yeah. It's a good question. We, and we have heard in some earlier presentations that, um, that the currents uh, are, are expected to change uh, as they flow through, but I haven't heard about wind speeds directly. So um, that's a good question. Um, a question from Terry in the uh, Q&A here about uh, what role BOEM will play, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management will play in establishing these areas or, or otherwise? So in, for, so BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management within the Department of the Interior, is responsible for leasing areas for offshore wind. The state will um, work with BOEM on its application for this research array and will need to obtain a federal lease for the research project. This is, a, in addition to that, there is a regional task force that BOEM is working with the, the three other states, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Maine, um, three total states, um, on areas for potential leasing in the Gulf of Maine. That task force was created, um, I wanna say a couple of years ago, held its first meeting December, 2019, has not held a meeting since then. There are no specific plans about timing for leasing. Although as Dan kind of walked through, there is growing interest in, uh, in, in certainly in more areas for offshore wind and for specifically in, in the Gulf of Maine as well. And so, um, I would anticipate that we would hear, you know, see more activity from, from BOEM at some point in terms of federal leasing. And so the state does um, have an ability to participate on that task force, bring information, share points of perspectives, ultimately it'll be a federal decision on where, and um, then they'll go through an, a process to auction off areas. And then there'll be a developer that will then plan a specific project in areas offshore. Thank you very much. Um, a few more questions about sort of how the site might be set up from some of the listeners. Um, one question is, do you know about the estimate of the depths of water at, uh, within the jagged oval? Yeah, there are fathoms on that one that I showed. Mm. Um, I want to say like 600 feet as a, as a kind of, um, wow. there are fathoms, let me see. There's somewhere between 60, 100 plus fathoms, which um, I don't remember the calculation of that, but I, I you know, I think yeah. 600 feet is probably what we kind of imagine it could plus or minus. Quite deep. 100. Yeah. Yeah. I did also looking at that chart, notice a reference to discarded depth charges. So I hope that's something, uh, yeah, folks are looking at too. Um, anyway, um, uh, David asks, um, about de-icing the turbines, and this may be a, a, a question also for Dr. Dogger or otherwise about um, 
how these things may survive in the in the winter? That's a that's a really good question. I um, I do not know the specifics, although um, I do know that we've seen uh, successful offshore wind projects in northern Europe and in other locations that probably have similar um, weather. Um, and then uh, as I don't know if Dr. Uh, Dogger showed you the video, but um, the, anticipated that it can withstand a 500 year storm. And so uh, um, designed for, for the main environment. Um. He did, yes. Um, a question about, so I was um, pretty confident in throwing out this big 156 gigawatt number uh, at, the, at the outset, which is, you know, that is not necessarily uh, realistic. That is like the, the, the capture, but, um, if we were to look forward, say all these, the array was very successful and technology was moving along quickly. Um, in a full build out scenario, at some point, what might that look like, would you say, in terms of number or area? You know, in terms of weather, it would be five, 556, or, or I'm sorry, 156 uh, gigawatts. Um, I, I do not know what it will look like. I think it depends a lot in terms of the um, specific state needs to meet our energy uh, energy over the long term. Um, and then uh, I th the other thing that is changing dramatically is the um, turbine size. And the uh, turbine manufacturers are, are, are continuing to innovate. And um, for this project, we for the research array, we anticipate 10 to 14 megawatt size turbines, but you know, we, um, we won't know that decision for a number of years. And I imagine that when you're looking at commercial leasing, which is an, uh, commercial projects, which are, are a number of years away, um, you know, I don't know where the line is in terms of the, the size of those turbines too. So um, that'll gotcha. be one component. Thanks. Um, and, and a clarifying question from Ernie about the sort of visualization of the blue dot slide um, showing the turbines in the water. Um, he asks, um, is the 16 mile area contiguous or is it the sum of many small areas surrounding the 12 turbines? Essentially, what we we're looking at, that was the, the blue dot, correct? Yeah, so in terms of what, um, whether we, this is, I've gotten this question before in terms of, are we going to choose, um, you know, one lease per turbine or, or a grouping of them or a contiguous area and and that final decision has been made but my my um i think uh opinion is that it is best suited for uh, one continue contiguous area where you can um then work within to make decisions about uh, micro siting uh and rather than having it spread over a uh, larger mileage great thanks um a, a, an important stat i think put in the uh questions right there from david which i uh, if it's accurate it, it's a great main yankee he says was um, 900 megawatt capacity, so just less than one gigawatt. So a full build out in the Gulf would be the power uh, of 156 main Yankees. Um, so that's quite a bit. Um, uh, John suggests, uh, or I'm sorry, I lost that question. David suggests putting a line of LEDs along the length of each blade to deter birds. Um, I encourage you to look back on our uh, research or our event with Dr. Albertani from Oregon State, who talked about um, some of the work he's doing on land and uh, on the water to put cameras or other ways to measure um, um, how, uh, how, uh, how birds are interacting with these turbines. Um, Carl asks about, um, so for the array, I believe he's referencing, um, how much energy may come out of that array and who uh, is selling it and who is buying it? Yes, so the specific megawatt number is not known. It'll depend on the number of turbines, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and the size of those turbines. Um, uh, and so that we don't have a specific megawatt number, although it'll be um, you know, in the range of uh, under 100 and, 40 or so megawatts of my anticipation. Um, and it will interconnect um, via cable in, uh, to shore um, and it will be uh, for a lease, um, it'll be, there'll be an operating agreement that will be for 20 years or more and it will go into um, the main grid and there'll be a negotiation between the Public Utilities Commission and the um, uh, developer on the project in terms of the specific rate um, for main repairs to uh, 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 cover the, the 
project. Excellent, thanks. Um, question from John is, um, how are, or what strategies might be put in place to deter uh, pleasure boats from sort of getting too close or hitting turbines, especially in the fog or something? Hmm. Both um, safety and navigation are, uh, will be an important piece of this. Um, and uh, I think that there, we wanna figure out a way to mark um, obviously areas where um, there, we don't, there would be limited areas where there would be, um, you know, not having track um, traffic and then um, uh, either some sort of demarcation of um, cable lines in the, in the way that can help the, the fishing industry, whether that be a marker buoy or some other way to mark it will be important. Um, and then, uh, so I think that would be, uh, have to figure that out with the Coast Guard. Um, and depending on whether it's uh, pleasure boats or fishing industry, um, our goal is to have fishing be in, uh, allowed within the turbine, uh, between the turbines. And so, but it's just a matter of working with um, different in industries and entities to determine um, what is safe, and then obviously marking where, where there is um, uh, areas for caution. Excellent. So I have 12.58 on my calendar, and I'd like to uh, head on time. So I'm going to end the questions here. And just to say to everyone watching, um, first of all, thank you for watching. Secondly, you are the people who are going to make sure this is done right. You are the people who are here to comment and to watch and to make sure that Maine can reduce our dependence on fossil fuels while still protecting our environment and our birds and our marine mammals. So please uh, continue your interest here. Continue to follow this issue along. Continue to engage with Maine Audubon and with uh, the state, the governor's energy office and the, the other um, pieces of the state and federal government who are working here. Uh, we really need your continued input and advice and interest and voice on this to make sure it's done the right way. Um, so thank you. Um, please stick with Maine Audubon. Um, uh, Deputy Director Cunningham, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the work you are doing, the difficult, complicated, complex work to push this uh, innovative technology forward and to hopefully um, get Maine to a better place. Thanks very much. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for joining us and thanks to everyone for, for joining. Uh, you can watch the recording on our website very soon. Have a great afternoon. Bye.